It is certainly true that all of the passages for today have something to do with wisdom, and this one does as well, but my focal point will be on the wisdom that is basically unwisdom, according to our world. This from Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 30, and if you want to follow along, and I do encourage it, and that you leave your Bibles open, you'll find it on page 45 in the New Testament portion of the Pew Bibles. So let's listen together for God's Word. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and slave of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. My focal point is the last part of this passage. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall while they were having this conversation on the way to Capernaum. I would have loved to hear those disciples talking. The other Gospels identify only two of the disciples as arguing over who was the greatest. It was James and John, according to them. But not here in Mark. Here in Mark, it's all the disciples. Did that mean they were having some sort of brag fest? I try to picture this in my mind. And then it came to me. About a week ago, on Thursday, I was invited by one of my colleagues to be a part of a meeting, a gathering of pastors at a church in Oak Cliff. Now, the idea and purpose of the meeting was for pastors who were black and white and brown to get together, begin developing relationships, and thereby be able to better serve our community in times of crisis. It made all the sense in the world. The majority of the pastors there were from non-denominational churches, but there was a smattering of Methodists, and a fair number of Baptists, and a bunch of AMEs. My friend and I were the only two Presbyterians at the gathering. It was impressive, though. There were about 70 pastors there, and there were round tables all around the room where we had lunch, and we also were to talk about various questions that had been posed to us. Now, I want you to think about this. There are between six and eight pastors at every table. All of us are people who like having air time. <laughs> so I want you to try to picture how you get a word in edgewise or how you take the conversation away from the other. And it occurred to me, this is perfect. This is a perfect demonstration of what Jesus meant because we all talked about what we were doing and we all talked about what we hoped to be doing and we all pontificated about what we should be doing. This was a little bit 
how probably all of our lives go sometimes. No, and I don't mean to say that we're crassly egotistical people, because we're generally not. At least I found that to be so in this congregation. No, we're just mildly I-centered. Just mildly. A mild case. And some of us have a mild case of being I-centered with a certain level of ego strength behind it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Most of you will remember the old story about Muhammad Ali in his younger years. You remember when he bragged about uh, he was the greatest and he was the king. And during that time, with characteristic cockiness, he boarded an airplane. And the attendant came down the aisle, making sure everyone's seats were in the upright position and all the tab tables were put away. And she noticed he wasn't wearing a seat belt. So she said, sir, would you please put the seat belt on? And his reply was, Superman don't need no seat belt. To which she replied, Superman don't need no airplane. <laughs> it's an oldie but a goodie. Some of us have that kind of ego strength behind us. We go out, we generally say what we mean, we aggressively make statements that say what we're about and what we mean and what we hope to obtain by it. Most of us either have lots of ego strength or we claim we've got very, very little. But in either case, see if this um, works for you. In either case, we have an easy time welcoming people who like us. We have an easy time welcoming people who are like us. Do you get that? There are plenty of us as well who have a very minor kind of ego strength. And we're eye-centered in the same way, just slightly differently. We can at least claim humility because we don't have to talk all the time. But we try to get our way through manipulation, what psychologists call passive-aggressive behavior. And I think most of you know what that's about. You deal with your needs very indirectly, but you make sure the people you're talking to know about that so that they will cave in and give you what you want. Some of Jesus' disciples were passive-aggressive. Some of them, for lack of a better phrase, were aggressive, aggressive. And one of the points of this passage, it seems to me, doesn't have to do with the different ways we are eye-centered. It has to do with what we tend to do in terms of welcoming people. People who are like us or people who will like us and therefore people who will help us feel better about us. Do you understand what I'm saying? The names of the people in this story have changed, but the reality is still the same. Among the members of a very large Presbyterian church in a large metropolitan area is a family that is one of the wealthiest families in the entire country. And one of the associate pastors of this congregation began a very informal effort to visit all of the families of the kids in the youth group. Now, some of you have heard this story before. And so he went about the business of visiting the families of the kids in the youth group. So one of the sons of this wealthy family happened to be a member of the youth group. And so he went to see them. And two days later, the senior pastor, who had heard about the call, summoned the associate into his office. I understand that you made a call on the Smith family. 
Well, yeah, the, the associate said, I did. Uh, their son's very active in the youth group. Listen, said the head of staff, you don't talk to the Smiths. I talk to the Smiths. Now, what that had to do with this is that it had to do with what people we welcome and what ones we don't. Coming from a personality of strong self-esteem, the senior pastor communicated something about who he welcomed and who the associate was going to welcome. And I suppose we all do this a little less overtly. Very, very differently. Some folk like to talk to people who are just like them. Some folk like to talk to people who are not like them so they can get pointers on how to do things better. There are lots of strangers around, and some people love talking to strangers, and other people don't want to do it. Who we welcome says something about who we are. Ahmed Mohammed, who is well known to all of you now, a brand new ninth grader going to high school at MacArthur High in Irving, whose enthusiasm for robotics and tinkering was so profound that he wanted to share this electronic clock that he'd made. And so he went and he showed his science teacher this clock and his science teacher said, oh, that's all, that's real interesting, but you might not want to divulge that to anyone else. And so when he got to his other classes, in one of the classes, an alarm that he had set on the clock went off. And that teacher took one look at it and contacted the principal's office. And he was summoned to the principal's office and was met there by four policemen, one of whom was heard to comment, and I quote, Yep, that's who I thought it was. That's who I thought it was. It seems to me that an excess of caution and fear are part of what has plagued all of our institutions everywhere. And even a ninth grader who is a self-professed and obvious nerd with dark skin and a Mideastern name, suddenly sets off alerts about his ability instead of welcome for his talent. And that's part of what Jesus was doing, I need to tell you. That's part of what Jesus was doing when he brought in a child to stand in front of the disciples. Now, this wasn't just a child who happened to be handy, who was part of the household. What he did was bring in a street child, a child who lived on the street, a child no older than seven. The Greek word for child here means a very small child, a little child. So these were people who were begging in the street. Some of them were homeless. Some of them were children of a widow. They were the lowest of the low. There was nothing sentimental about these kinds of children in Jesus' time. And they weren't even the kind of children who would deserve the advocacy that we provide for kids now. As in every culture, there was profiling. And that child that Jesus set before the disciples was, in every sense of the word, a poster child for profiling. They were the least able to return favors. They could offer nothing by way of you welcoming them. There was no return in a society that was loaded with status and making sure that you exchange the proper tokens of that status. Jesus was saying, anyone who welcomes this kind of child welcomes me. And not just me, but the one who sent me. 
Now, what does that have to do with us? To be able to welcome those who are improper, those who are outside the pale, those who are politically incorrect, those who are obnoxious beyond belief, welcome those who are not like us. Friends, I think it just simply comes down to whether or not we believe that Jesus Christ is alive and that he is the head of the church and whether we choose to act upon the way he would have us act, whether we'll be ruled by what's proper and correct and eye-centered or whether or not we'll live life in community by sharing a different kind of welcome. There's an old legend um, that one day Abraham was sitting by his tent door and he saw an old man coming down a pathway very close by. The old man was weary. He was leaning very heavily upon his staff and his feet were bleeding from having come a number of miles. And with a true sense of hospitality, Abraham invited the old man to come in and to share his meat and to share lodging for the night. And as they sat down at table, Abraham happened to notice that the old man asked no blessing on his meal. And so he asked him why he did not pray to God. And what the old man said was, I am a fire worshiper and I acknowledge no other God. Well, at this, Abraham grew very angry, and he told the man to leave his tent and not come back. Then later, when God called Abraham, Abraham was asked, where is the old man for whom I've cared for over a hundred years, even though he has dishonored me? Could you not endure one night and so prove to him God's love? A good question. Who welcomes this little child welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. Amen.